the galaxy burns. The heretic falls. And the emperor protects. Welcome, friends, to The Emperor Protects. My name is Doug, along with my co-host. Uh, that's going to be Dan. How you doing, buddy? Doing great. Ready to talk about some space wolves. Yes, and this this is going to be a book where there are a great many thoughts. We've, we've had a pregame <laughs> <laughs> of, yes. of discussion, and uh, if you don't know, the, the events that we're going to talk about, the book we're covering, Prospero Burns, by Dan Abnett, is part of kind of a one uh, one half of a whole story that has to do with the Space Wolves fighting the Thousand Suns. And originally, the this book and A Thousand Suns were supposed to release in tandem, but there were actually, I don't know if you know this, Dan, was a delay. Yes. Uh, because Evan had some personal emergencies, yep. and then uh, it came out shortly after. So they're, they're mirror books, so if you want to read it, catch up, blah, rather, on our coverage of Thousand Suns. We just did that episode last, so I would say go listen uh, to that one either next or before, depending on sure. if you're a Chaos player or not. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, so just kind of keep that in mind, that we're going to have some things that are conflicting and some that are retreads. Uh, so if we kind of skip over some stuff, it's probably because we've already talked about it, like the Council and Ikea and that kind of thing. Right, right. Um, just kind of throwing that out there. But we have a great many opinions about this book, uh, and people were really excited about it. I, I put the call out for questions, and I didn't get any questions from anybody, but I got a whole lot of, man, I'm really excited for you to cover uh, Prospero Burn. So. Oh, good. Okay. Yes. Um, and and with that, I think maybe some of our next episodes we should cover, like, going into the detail of Space Marine Legions, because this is a a very interesting look at a legion at this point but later mm -hmm. on a chapter that it's often misunderstood and so yes. we can have a whole talk about that um, absolutely and so let's jump into it so we have our uh dan you always put together the, the most comprehensive outlines and i love them <laughs> it's basically well, you do all the work and then i come in and i'm like hey <laughs> <laughs> so i want to start out and then, then kind of do the brief at the beginning but start out by saying this story, after you read, you know, the th or listen to the Thousand Sons, uh, this story is basically, you know, the same kind of wrapped in of the Emperor's angry. Magnus did the right thing for the wrong reason. Uh, he <laughs> sends Russ to bring Magnus to justice, not kill him. By the way, that's a very important distinction. Yep. Uh, and originally, anyway, and you know. The planet of the sorcerers isn't going to be an easy target, uh, but it's, you know, it's the space wolves with Lehman Russ. And so Russ is angry. He's going to bring Magnus to justice. That's it's kind of the the same theme in terms of the overall purpose of the story. In terms of the book itself, it is really A Thousand Suns, the book, from the perspective of the space wolves, kind of. And the reason that it's it's kind of is that Prospero Burns actually begins a hundred years before the Space Wolves assault Prospero. Yeah. So you get a lot of exposition here, you know, what led up to it from the Space Wolves perspective. And also it's told from the point of view of uh, an individual named Casper Hauser, and that's really important name. So remember that one, listeners. Casper Hauser, and he's a Terran academic, basically, and he's been tasked to become a skjald, which is like a storyteller. You know, you mm -hmm. think of the Viking thing that they really didn't have a lot of writing, but they did a lot of oral history, and yep. a lot of their culture was based on storytelling. So he's been assigned to the third company of the Space Wolves to be their skjald or storyteller. And uh, it, it really seems to be Hauser's story because a lot of it is from his perspective and what happens to him. But there it's kind of like a weird murder mystery in that there's this really important subplot and things happen that feed into that as the book goes on. And you realize that it's all about chaos machinations, putting, you know, the space wolves against the thousand suns and pitting them against each other. So that's 
kind of what this book is. It also gives some background on Horus's fall, which is interesting because there's some involvement of another legion. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I think it provides a more coherent view of the heresy in terms of, you know, chaos has this plan and this is an important part of that plan. Yes. Yeah. Um, I would say they, they definitely cover similar events, but mm. also like from a, um, from a literary perspective, they're very different books where the thousand oh. sons oh. follows a group of people, some Astartes, some human, and, and kind of goes into their own little subplots and they have their own character growths and developments. This book is centered, anchored really to one person. Yeah. You mentioned him, Casper Hauser. We gain information with him. We question his own sanity with him in real time. <laughs> and, and so because of simply the framework of the book, it makes them wildly different, even though there's humans in both that are watching <laughs> things happen. And so you kind of have to, when we talk about like, what is one better, they're, they're just, they're very different. And so uh, we're just going to go through the events. We'll, we'll start rolling through it. Uh, do you mind if I, I do a little timeline catch up to where no, we please. are? please. Okay. Please do that. Absolutely. So realistically, our uh, our book starts when Casper's having a bad Monday where he <laughs> he was approaching Fenris and, uh, you know, he was a, a totally uh, approved guest, but he still got shot out of the sky by accident. Um, yeah, I guess that's kind of a reveal later on, but he gets shot out of the sky mm -hmm. and essentially the warring tribes of Fenris, the, the humans that are raised to still be this primitive Viking culture mm -hmm. are fighting mm -hmm. over him. Some rescued him and then other tribes are like, he's what's called a bad star, uh, an omen of ill intent. And we need to kill him to honor, I don't know, a Valhalla, whatever you want to, you know, whatever yeah, <laughs> that particular tribe tends to believe. Um, and with this, he, I'm just going to kind of fast forward through cause it's a lot of like cool survival stuff that gives you, I think the feel and the imagery of the space wolves. Yes. in Fenris too. And yeah. As an environment, but it's not like story important. It's no, just, it's no. just cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, right. Read it cause it's cool. But, uh, then we fast forward, he gets picked up by, uh, a particular, uh, space wolf. I believe his name. Yes. Yeah. His name is. Bear. Yes. And Bear is the guy who he had to do the, the grudging mission of going and fetching the human because he was the one who accidentally shot him out of the sky. <laughs> it's because kind of this awkward, hey, sorry. <laughs> um, and he's kind of being derided by all of his fellow space wolves for shooting down the wrong target. <laughs> yes. So, uh, we'll get we'll get to know Bear more over the course of the story. He's a, he's a big oh, dude. Yes. Yeah. So, um, from that point, we then kind of end up with our main character, Casper Hauser, at uh, called the Fang, which is the home base of the Space Wolves, and and that kind of sets up the first act of the book. It's it's mm -hmm. his arrival, and yes. I think it's important for the sake of how the story is framed. It does certainly endear us to the main character, Casper Hauser. Yes, and you know how he got there. It's, yep, it's it's a great great introduction there. Yeah, uh, and uh, just. Quick uh, notes. This is pre-heresy. Um, he is yes. basically a, a collector of information. He tried to start. Um, I can't remember the word. Like a symposium type thing. Yeah, yeah conservatory. conservatory. There we go. Uh, yeah. Of information. And he's basically. He's a an educated man. Who's just trying to always learn more. And he wanted to learn about Fenris. So yeah. that's how he got there. Yeah. And. <laughs> Uh, there are two names when you talked about, you know, the tribes fighting over him. one tribe called the Askamani. They're the ones who are trying to save him. Uh, there are two of the four tribesmen who came out survived. One is named Fifth and one is named Brahm. And we're going to hear about them later. Mm -hmm. There's some references to those two. So I just wanted to drop those names so that people realize what they had to do with him at all. Uh, where they survived. Um, and the other thing we, we talked about, you know, just some detail is there's some stuff. We'll, we'll comment on it a lot more at the end, but there are just some things in the book that happen and they just like happen. And you're, you're going, what, where, why? And you kind of find out later, but there's no 
preparation. Yeah. So <laughs> one of the things is, so Bear rescues, you know, these two tribesmen and, and Hauser, and all of a sudden he kind of looks at, at least that's the way I'm reading it, he looks at Hauser kind of in a weird way and he sees his eye, his right eye. And it's like, okay, there's something wrong with your eye. We can't have that there. And he just literally reaches up and rips his eye out. It's a bionic eye. It's a it's an augmented eye. And you go and what? Yeah. <laughs> and it's just part of that thing you talked about where the literary style is very different. Yep. When unexpected things happened in the Thousand Sons, for some reason you seem to kind of know they were coming. You know, they weren't huge surprises, but it's just little incidents like this. And you're going, OK, yeah, uh, yeah, just absolutely. Let me know what's happening. <laughs> uh, there, there's a lot of those. Yeah, we learn later that like, well, the bionic eye, the space wolves don't really record anything in terms of video recording, which the bionic eye could do. So they ripped it out and they put in like a, a gene grown wolves eye. And so yes, yes. we and again, it's it's a framing device. We're learning everything with hauser at the same time so yes. like he's walking around going how come i can only see out of one eye and it's the eye he ripped out it's because the wolf eye has low light vision so yes. he's only seeing out of the replaced yep. eye. i don't know stuff like that is very cool it's very puts you in the scene <laughs> it does it, 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 it's very wolfy it gives yes. you that feel which is why this book is from the perspective of the space wolves you're getting a better idea of who they are as uh, uh a chapter you know yeah. or as a legion um, so uh, what we kind of start out the this main part of the book where Hauser's spent a lot of time uh, in a essentially a Sasanic coma they yes. put him for a very long time. I think the book refers to like 20 Fenrisian years, which is about 70 Terra years. So it's like a long time. Yes, very long. A really long time, which interestingly enough makes up most of that 100 years that we <laughs> – if we started out, like, how are you going to go through 100 years? Well, he yeah. just sleeps for 100 hours. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Took right? a good nap. <laughs> and so he wakes up from this, and obviously he's very disoriented, and as any of us would be. You know, you wake up in a place you're totally unfamiliar with, and he fights off a bunch of Legion thralls in the Et, or the Fang, also called the Et, and... He, uh, this, a couple of space wolves get him and they bring him for a guy named Scarsonson, who is the captain of the wolves fifth company. So Scarsonson has a rune priest, which are essentially the psychers or the librarians for the space wolves. <laughs> wizards, not wizards. <laughs> wizards. They're not sorcerers. <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and his name is Weirdmake, Othir Weirdmake. And he tells Hauser that his body has been physically rebuilt and enhanced by the Legion Apothecaries because we kind of find out through this conversation that he was kind of old, actually. He'd, yeah. he'd been around a while, and his body was failing, and the wolves are like, well, if you're going to be a scald and you're going to be hanging out with us, you can't have this decrepit body. <laughs> um, so it, it made sense, you know? Yeah, they gave him a tune-up. You think about it. Um, and that's when they added the eye you talked about. Uh, so he's light sensitive. Um, and one of the things that was kind of weird is that Hauser actually understood, and this is, they were kind of looking at him like, what's going on? He understood both their common and their combat languages. And that's one of the, again, one of those things where it's just there, like they talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going, where did that come from? Like, <laughs> Yeah, they're like, well, how do you speak our language? We didn't put that into you. You just had that. And right. it's just it sits there for a long time. Right. And you you know that that's obviously, it, when we talk about the legions, the wolves are not what people think they are. Yes. They're not a bunch of barbarians. They just aren't. And so you know that their suspicions and their questions are being piqued when things like that happen. Yes. And they see that. So can I also just add when yes, they when please. they tuned him up, please. They did like gene therapy. They made him basically mm -hmm. a lot younger. He was had the body of like his twenty year old prime, and he's all strong now. But they also mm. skinned him. Like they skinned mm. him and put his skin back onto him. Which when I read that, I was like, ugh, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I didn't have anything else for her. I was like, that could have done without that. <laughs> and so, oh God. So it's fun because you, you have um, a fixed perspective of his, but he's also like a stranger in his own body at this point. So we're like, we're super on board with him. I thought that was a really good use of like, I don't know, sci-fi jargon and perspective. <laughs> Right. Exactly. No, no, you're absolutely right. And, you know, when I think of, uh, you know, how grossed out you were, it is now with him being skinned. All I can do is picture chaos banners now. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, are they going to use them for banners like the, the like yeah. the heresy guys do? Right. Oh, crazy. So uh, one of the things then that we're going to talk about is that throughout the novel, um, we get these flashbacks into Hauser's past life. Yes. And he was a child at this desert orphanage. He has a career at this conservatory that he's trying to build and, you know, make worthwhile and fill with knowledge. Um, And one of his biggest struggles is he's trying to keep it independent from the administratum. Yep. Because of course they want their faces in everything. Um, And, one of the most, I think, um, important flashbacks we see is that there's an encounter between Hauser uh, with his archaeological team and the 15th Legion, who are the Thousand Sons. Uh, they were sent to secure an area that Hauser's team was investigating. And you're like, why the Thousand Sons? Like, there were all these legions, right, mm-hmm. that could have been sent. And going why then yeah yeah you have to ask right yep and one of the things they also mention and this is another thing that is a theme throughout this book is this fixation on names and they bring up the fact that the legionnaires were taking a real interest in his name like what is your name where does it come from what's the source of your name you know blah 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 going through that um (laughs) Again, why? Well, it pays off. It's a big payoff in this story. But you get that early premonition of something is going on with names. And when you think about that, at least, Doug, it made me think about how important it is in the lore, whether it's heresy or 40K lore, to know a demon's true name. Yes, yes. Because I mean, when you can control a demon, you know a demon's true name, you can either banish it or you can control it, right? And yep. so I thought that was a real interesting tie-in with that. Yes, and if you, I mean, I, I know the books that you and I are thinking of are the Grey Knight Omnibus, <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> which is so good. And they, they go all into like knowing a demon's name and, and how far people will go to get it. But uh yeah, I mean it's that's just a very established thing. So like if you if you know it and you're into that part of 40k lore, your brain is screaming of like mm. why is everybody up in everybody's business? <laughs> why do why do you want to know my name? It's the equivalent of someone coming up to you and asking like your mother's maiden name, the street you grew up on, and all those it's like so fishing children. questions, yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um The other thing is there's some conversation about his decision uh, to travel to Fenris so late in life because he could have gone when he was younger. Yep. You know, but there it's kind of blown off as being explained, saying, "Ah, you know, he's he has this academic curiosity. He's frustrated at the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, He wants to just find out more about the wolves, as you said. But. There's also this implication that it may not have been his idea to go to Fenris. Yeah, there's a there's a gap of information of how he actually got from the last memory of him being like, the yep. conservatory is dead if the administratum gets it, and then waking up after being shot out of the sky. <laughs> yeah. And but that just that small mention of the you know the 15th legion being there you know kind of as an escort for his team you're like okay they did something yeah because you know they can do something and the other thing besides the psyker aspect of it is okay this is like something alfarius would do this is like an alpha legion thing you know did they is he like 
you know, Manchurian candidate kind of thing. That's what I thought right away, you know, an, an implanted spy kind of deal right away that came to my mind. Yeah. And I don't know why, but it was like, yeah, something's going on here. Yep. Uh, so yep. anyway. Uh, so, so go ahead. You no, know, go ahead, please. I was going to say, so as we're, we're kind of moving through, they the next section of the book, I would say, to kind of sum it up, is is inducting Hauser into their culture. Yeah. Yeah, as That's far as like a general theme of the area, uh, part of the book. Yeah. Where, you know, he stands, but he gets to meet the the leader of the company, and, and we learn with him, you know, if you're... <laughs> If you're if you have no information about Space Wolves and you just came to 40k, it's a great book to read to like he's learning their language with them. And so you can really get into it of like he breaks down, okay, so this is their word for chapter and company and they don't call themselves Space Wolves, they call themselves Volca Fenrica. They mm-hmm. you know, the the joke about there not being any wolves on Fenris and you know, you're getting introduced to all those, which I thought was great. It uh, is. It's just, really important to it when we, you know, cover later books. Yeah. How offended, how offended, I remember, I can't remember the book itself. I think it was when Lehman, we're going ahead a little bit, but when Lehman Roos, uh, Lehman Russ went after Horace, he actually went after him and there was this scene where these people came in and they were being told because they were going to see the Primarch, don't call him a space wolf. Do yep. not call it. They, they just, it, it's a carryover from what you just said is they're so offended when people call them space wolves because that's an imperial thing. Yeah. And we don't do imperial, you know? Yep. Yeah. I mean, so, it, you know, it's you, when you visit a tribal culture, you, you speak the language of the people and they're like, we don't, that's not a word that we recognize. <laughs> yeah. Yep. You're like, well, that's cool. Um, but so it's a it's a section of learning. He starts to follow along with the space wolves as they go further out of the Fang, getting to know their customs. Um, he's introduced to basically the cast of characters we're going to follow: the priests and the the wolf lord. Uh, let's see. Mm-hmm. And at the same time, he is constantly dealing with these flashbacks that you're talking about. It's kind of hard without a play by play of like emphasizing. There's a lot of memory is is a constant theme in this book. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and and the story and perspective, and so um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know another way to 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 out uh, to kind of no. articulate that as a point, but <laughs> no, that's that's a good that's a good way to put it. I think really sweet. Um, really is. Are we ready to? Where do you want to go next from here? Well, I don't know. Kind of talk about um, once Hauser actually becomes part of the third company. We could talk about that a little bit, maybe. Oh, um, yeah. He starts sense. telling the stories. Like, he'll start collecting tales of heroes, and then he, like, does those, like, cool Viking Great Hall recounting. He basically becomes yes. a, a bard. The Legion's bard. <laughs> right. It's what he is. And yeah. he, I guess the significant uh, encounter that I picked up on was during their, their they end up, uh, the space wolves being part of this 40th expeditionary fleet, and they assault this thing called the Olamic Quietude, and it's actually a, a human culture, very technologically advanced, mm-hmm. and obviously, the third company is going to be called in to assist with this compliance. Uh, and as you said, he sees them in action. He's telling stories. He's compiling his, you know, story library that he can tell later on. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, after there, he goes to an Imperial army camp and he's part of, you know, the, he's witness to a kind of a strategy session. They have that kind of thing. Yep. And afterwards, some soldiers attack him just because he was part of, they consider them bestial, you know, the six legion. Yes. His Imperial guardsmen do. And you're like, yeah, <laughs> I wished you would say that in the face of a space wolf and watch him tear your head off. I just <laughs> would have done that, right? But they pick on this guy. It's just interesting that there's that prejudice within the Imperium against these guys. Of course, yep. You know, very, very interesting. Um, it, it, so, yeah. And part of that ahead. is just because they, 
he has a i mean i love the dialogue he has with like the commanding officer of he's like i have i've served next to i don't remember how many legions i think it was five five legions and he kind of recounts how they all fight and then when he gets to the space yes. wolves he's like they are monsters <laughs> <laughs> and like the next conversation in the book is the acting <laughs> officer of the space wolves being like do i have your permission to do anything necessary to achieve this he's like yep he's like okay i just wanted that in writing <laughs> And he's like, they think we're barbarians, but I definitely asked permission. And you're like, that doesn't mean anything, dude. <laughs> right? Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, these guys pick this fight with him and they don't realize that he's been kind of kitted out. Yes, yes. He kind of kicks their butts. <laughs> yeah, they thought they were going to fight a librarian and they picked on a UFC champion or something. like. <laughs> it was really crazy, man. Um, and then a re- I thought it was a really neat uh, connection that was established during the assault on one of these subterranean cities. There's a rune priest in the third company and his name is Heroth. And he's mortally wounded defending Hauser from yeah. some of these super soldiers, the the humans had, these other humans. And Hauser stays with him. You kind of can picture this scene somewhere in a movie where someone is dying, you know, soldiers dying, and somebody just stays there with them to keep them company as they're fading. Yep. You know, how important that is for that person to have, not be alone when they're dying. And I just, it was really neat to see that happens. And then Hauser and he kind of exchange stories, which is really kind of cool too. Yep. So Hauser tells him a story from his past when he was the conservator on Terra. And there was a colleague who ended up um, employing some low level psychic it's magic, but it's psychic powers mm-hmm. to help them uh, escape when they were ambushed by some thugs. And this colleague then took them, took him to meet members of an arcane cult and they actually had been part of this cult for a very long time. And he noticed that his colleague had been collecting notes on artifacts that had the eye of Horus on them. Yes. And you're going, whoa, okay. This is like big picture stuff now. Where did this come from? Mm -hmm. This is not just Space Wolves against Thousand Suns. And man... Yeah, that that really to me was like okay, huge reveal, huge tie-in with all the others. There's something going on here, some kind of a conspiracy. Well, and I I love the way they did it because um, it, it that was a very important memory, and they go back to it multiple times. But mm-hmm. in the context of the story, um, the they're trying to share their most wiggity stories of like fate and what they call the maleficarum so like mm. the ethereal the other side with the warp yes um, the warp that's their word for the warp yeah. yeah and and so uh they tell that story a lot and every time it happens casper's like well that's the most creepy warp thing that's happened to me and immediately whoever talk is to whoever is talking to him goes no it's not don't be stupid and <laughs> but it happens again and again but it's again one of those things that's just thrown right. out there this is not the most psychic chaosy thing that's happened to you, but he has no context for it yet. Yeah, and then and then Heroth tells him a story in which they're both nearly killed by this huge black wolf. Yes. Um, or by another Fenrisian animal, and they're saved by a big black wolf. And it turns out that this black wolf is a reincarnated form of Brahm, who is one of the uh, warriors that saved Hauser, right? And he sees this, he's going, whoa, what? Th- so ha- this guy is really a part of my scheme. You know, they call it that, that weave of my life, this guy. Uh, and so it was really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, no, actually. He died because he did die when he was defending uh, Hauser. Yeah, I want to point out here that there's some... Like even though the Thousand Suns have uh, probably lore wise a much stronger connection to the warp, I felt like this book had more wiggity imagery and language than mm. I felt like very 
on point in Thousand Suns, like knowing exactly when they had stepped into the warp and when they weren't. And oh, here it's... they fade in and out. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it's it's almost like a waking dream kind of thing. It is, yeah. And so it becomes hard where you're like, you read a section and at the end of it, you're like, did that just happen or not? Like, I don't know. <laughs> oh, and then speaking of that, the creepiest thing is when Hauser comes out of the dream state, because they both went into it, Hera's been dead for like several minutes and you're going, whoa, how could he be telling his story if he's dead? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, creepy. Yeah. And you don't trust anything anymore. And you're like, oh man. Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, obviously they hold a funeral for Heroth and, you know, it's the scald Hauser's reciting all these stories and telling tales and all these kind of things. Um, and then the actual captain of the third company, his name is Helmstrad, I think, or whatever. Uh, he selects um, Hellwinter, a, a rune priest named Hellwinter, as the new chief rune priest for the company. Yeah. Um, and Hauser... Like, <laughs> he paid the 35 points for the upgrade. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. Yeah, exactly. You're now the master of ceremonies or whatever. <laughs> exactly army builder yeah yes okay go on <laughs> <laughs> great reference so hauser like sees that there are there's a ritual going on and hauser sees that he's using this weird knife and he gets really upset about it because he says that that is the same knife that the cultists were using in their rituals in that dream state he just had with with heroth yeah and going wait a minute hell winter goes okay step back kid just just step back okay yeah <laughs> you know somebody and this is this is where all of a sudden here we go like where did this come from so hell winter who is you know the new rune priest the new guy on the block the 35 point upgrade he says hey let me just tell you what's going on man somebody has been playing you yep Somebody has been psychically manipulating you. Why do you think you came to Fenris? Of all the places you could have gone, you came to Fenris. And you've got my knife confused with somebody from the past. They're two different weapons, right? But mm -hmm. the point is that he says this to him. And he's like, whoa, God. And as the reader, you're going, what? Yep. So, so this is when our our trust in the narrator falls apart. Yes, because what he what he posits is somebody is making you dream horror things about my specific knife to turn you against me. Who mm. would do that and why? And so now it's like he's peaked. I mean, he's always had the interest of the wolves, but they're how acutely they are looking at him is now being revealed like, oh, I'm under a microscope. <laughs> like, oh, and, dang. <laughs> He's having a rough day. Space, to that point, we know the space wolves, too, are predators, you know, yes. and they have they have heightened senses. Even in the game and in the lore, they have heightened senses. And you can almost think about, like, dogs. When they smell somebody or something – and they know something's wrong with it just from the scent. Yep. You can kind of see the space wolves scenting this guy and going, he's not right. Yep. You <laughs> Yep. Well, and what I like is that it's revealed that that was always the case. Like, yes. Th since Hauser landed, they have always been suspicious. I mean, not in a hostile way. They're like, you know, if we know you're a spy, maybe we can figure out who's using you. Mm -hmm. And so all the things were not necessarily to test his loyalty, but to test, like, do, are you conscious of being manipulated? And the answer yeah. was, no, he's a good guy. He's not evil. Sure. He's being used. And so now we can offer him the opportunity to, to like, use himself against whoever's controlling him, basically. Right. Redemption for you. <laughs> kind of, yeah. Even though, you, even though you think you don't need it with Yep. You're a pawn, um, but a pawn can still choose to do the right thing right now. Right. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so kind of a, uh, what is it when you're, when you're not 
the spy, you're the counter spy, you're a double agent. He's kind of, yes. kind of trying to turn him into a double agent, I guess that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. Uh, um, so shall we move on to Ikea? Yes, please. Is, is that, that a good place? So We do skip around quite a bit in the story, so that's not... Yeah, it's, kind of, it's just as so abrupt to, in the book. <laughs> we're trying to move us forward, yeah, uh, with all the distractions as we're walking down the path. So three space pool companies get summoned to Ikea for the infamous conclave. Uh, we know all about that by now. Yep. You know, what the emperor was trying to do, or not trying to do, what he intended to do all along, probably. Um, so... Hauser, because he's not part of this discussion, is left in a room with a bunch of silent sisters. We talked about them before. They are pariahs. They negate any psychic influence or yep. psychic powers. Um, and so the funny thing is, is that when he meets with, and because there's all these other, really, this is what was a real big surprise to me, Doug, too, was all of a sudden you see all these huge characters from the from the lore show up to interview this dude. Yep. Like, Russ is there. Fulgrim. Valdor. Uh, Ralderon, who is like the equerry to Sanguinius. Yep. You know? <laughs> Typhon is there. Yeah. Like, wh what? Like, this must be really important for all these people. And the funny thing was that you knew something wasn't right when he could not understand Russ. Right? Yes. Because... He was no longer being psychically influenced because of the sisters, so he didn't have that ability to understand Fenrisian or their combat can't anymore. Yeah, uh, so they, they really interesting. The the wolves didn't want to bring the sisters of silence to the Fang for obvious privacy reasons. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so what they did was they created this little like the quiet room they called it, where they brought Hauser in, <laughs> and he room. he lost the ability to speak the Fenrika, like all of their, mm -hmm. their tongue, their war tongue, their logo. All he could do is speak low Gothic English. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what Russ then kind of slopes out of the corner is like, I was speaking to you in a language that you should have known by all accounts, which tells me this language was incepted inside of you so that you would understand it and then be able to relay it. So he's, he's really unraveling of like, Mm -hmm. these plots are coming to a head and there is somebody here who's doing this to you because otherwise why would they want you here and so he kind of this is russ is the one who personally presents the the counter spy offer and then brings him in front of yeah fulgrim and all this huge list of characters and at first i was like man this seems kind of um over the top and kind of, kind of like reader i don't know you're, you're trying to like play the reader with like all these yeah. naming all these bigwigs yeah. but in the context what's happening is that the whole thing is really a trial against magnus and the thousand sons mm -hmm. and casper hauser represents the why we can't trust the thousand sons and how they use psychic power mm -hmm. and so he really is brought before all these important people to he's the perfect demonstration and so in yep. the moment i was like this seems like too much it seems like fanfare for the reader and then in context of where they are it's like no it had to be nikea he's evidence like mm -hmm. he, they're messing with him something's not right and casper is kind of slowly unraveling what happened to him over the course of this but um tell us what happened to Poor Casper, while all of the stuff from the Thousand Sons book is happening with the trial, what's going on with, with Hauser? Yeah, so one of the things I wanted to mention real quickly, too, was I thought it was interesting, the collection of people who came to interview him, because there were people from both sides of the argument. Yes, and, and, I thought and that was loyalist really, and chaos. <laughs> yes, and I thought that was really good that it wasn't just one side seeing this evidence it was everybody now knew it yep. whether you were supportive or against you know use of psychic powers you saw this evidence and and that really was kind of interesting from a a trial perspective you know yes. making the argument so uh, he knows what he is he knows who have has manipulated him now and he's being escorted from the room the the silent room you know, the quiet room and uh, there's a custodian named Amon Turamakian. I think that's how I pronounce that. So all of a sudden, <laughs> who shows up? But he sees Amon 
of the Thousand Sons. And hey. if, if you recall our story, Amon was a Corvidae, you know, so he's got like that prescience kind of thing going on, kind of like Aramon did. Um, he's still a very powerful psyker. He was one of the inner circle. If I'm not mistaken, he's he was the equerry to uh, Magnus, I think, in the stories. I can't recall exactly, but a very important Thousand Sons. And he's there. And he uses the custodian's name, which is the same as his, Amon, and he paralyzes a custodian. Now, just the thought that he could do that is scary as hell. Yes. Like, this is a custodian. This isn't a space marine. This is like the guys, right? And he paralyzes him. And then he kind of uh, confirms with Hauser everything that he's just been told. And Hauser's just like powerless. He, he has no idea what's going on. And all of a sudden, Bear and Hellwinter show up. <laughs> and then it all hell breaks loose. And Amon is able to use Hellwinter's name uh, against him psychically. But strangely enough, the power doesn't work on Bear. And this is it, this just makes you go, wow, what is going on? So Amon is driven off, or quote Amon. We have to put the quotes there. Yeah. Um, we don't know anything just, about anything. <laughs> no, he, he's driven off. He's badly wounded. You know, so Bear kicked his butt, and it, you know, I'm I'm assuming that this uh, character, this Amon, quote Amon wasn't going to kill Hauser because he was there for a reason. What's the point in killing him? You know, right. you, you're not going to kill your own spy, but why not beat up on a bunch of other loyalists? So uh, <laughs> that that's what happened. And it was just such a weird, all of a sudden thing. And the, the whole scene itself was just full of contradictions to me. Yeah. And, and this is uh, where I'll introduce one of my criticisms of the book is the pacing. Mm -hmm. because i felt like we go from learning about the wolves and then the pacing of shifting from that perspective to now casper is the absolute center of some level of intrigue happened mm -hmm. aggressively fast and so there was like two chapters are like I'm, i mean i dig the fight scene it was cool yeah but, but i don't know what's going on <laughs> so but it kind of yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it was it was kind of jarring at that point, but I'm, I'm intrigued like what's going on with Casper. Um he at this point we learn with him what's go you know what the council in IKEA is all about and and kind of more I don't know, information I guess for us the reader mm -hmm. <laughs> is provided. Sure. But um so yeah, that's the big thing on Nikea and at this point it's fully out there that um the, the custodes and stuff explained to him like, hey, this memory you have of like you leaving the conservatory because it was going to the administration, that's all fake. In fact, uh, the, the man Malkador himself wants to fist bump you like and tell you that you're a good person. And he's like, oh, so all of all of his memories from that point are fake and, and his motivations are wrong and how he got on Fenris. And so he's kind of coming to grips with that quite a bit. You know, there's so many movies we see, especially science fiction movies, but other movies, too, where somebody's memories are implanted. Yes. You know, I think of like Blade Runner with if for anybody who saw that the character Rachel, all her memories were implanted. Yep. Uh, Ghost in the Shell, you know, the character that ScarJo played, all her memories were implanted. None of it was real. And so this made sense to me though because i've seen that kind of a thing before yeah and so from that perspective it was like okay yeah i can see people doing this yep. to you. and and then it becomes there's a, a lot of repetition with the memories that we've mm. already read because what they're trying to do is go into his mind and retroactively figure out who's doing this to him yes so he has this memory of him waking up on terra going to his window and then he hears a creepy voice and they, they keep replaying it. There's like a scene where it's like three times in a row they replay the exact same wake-up schedule. And I was like, okay, yes. I'm done with this. Yes. <laughs> but uh, they do that, and it, he keeps trying to turn around to see who's talking to him. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to go from there? No, go. I just what happens, you know, as part of this is is that um, Hell Winter now is kind of and Weird Make both. Um, they're kind of um, in a dream. They're they're kind of in his head. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, they're taking a can so, opener to a psyche. <laughs> yeah, and then there's another room priest. This is Hale Wolf. Hale Wolf was another one. He's attempting to break into Hauser's mind, and Hellwinter's trying to distract this other entity, whatever it is. Um, and while they're in this woods or wherever they are that you talked about, you know, this this place they are, um, basically they told Hauser just stay behind here. And Hauser hears Weird Make, it, like he's injured. Something is happening that he can't see. And he sees a really large, like, shadowy wolf figure. This makes sense, of course, wolf. Mm -hmm. uh, and he runs into Hail Wolf. And he's been injured as well. And he warns Hauser that Hellwinter is being influenced, right? Mm. That... Um, Hellwinter is the one that has become possessed, actually, in this place where they are in his mind. He's been possessed by this entity. Yep. Well, he runs into Hellwinter, who's been it, – it's just – there's all this stuff happening. It's so weird. Hellwinter comes and says, no, it's Hailwolf. He's the one who's been possessed. And so the other two room priests team up, bring down Hailwolf, and he transforms into this wolf. So – this entity, whatever it was, had taken Hellwolf, had taken control of him. They see this wolf, and then Hellwolf confesses that, and this again is the, the big picture thing, that he saw an anathema and a plot against Horus. Yep. And you're going, okay, now all, all these names, all this stuff happening – could you just not have gotten to the point? <laughs> I, it, but it's an important piece because we know exactly that scene from one of the earlier books of the Anathema and Horus. So yes. as you said, this is pre-heresy. This is foreboding. This is a vision of something that's going to happen. And and so trying to put it all together, it, it seems as though from like the collection of conversations and stuff that members of chaos legions or legions that would go to chaos started just abducting people in all levels of society, brainwashing them and using them as unwitting spies. Yes. This was then used to spy and instigate problems between the thousand sons and the space wolves by forces unknown hitherto <laughs> sure um and so casper now finds himself in the absolute dead center of this like oh like i'm just one little like plot in a greater machination the mm. the five years of, of gap in time that it took for them to like break his brain and, and send him to fenris or whatever that gap of time that's missing is nothing compared to how big these schemes are mm -hmm. and so it just seemed strange because in a book about space wolves punching the thousand suns there's first of all very little of that it's heavy yes. on the space wolves but also yes. it weirdly enough i think shows the scale and magnitude of what horus is trying to do that the whole universe was like no <laughs> like slow motion warning of what's going on and nobody mm -hmm. nobody who could do a thing was listening <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know it was just it was a lot <laughs> well and this is confusing is this you know, kind of confrontation I just talked about in this, when they were in this dream, when they were in his head, as confusing as that is, it's really to me, because again, it, I'm referring to another book where Lehman Russ had to go into this dream state. Yes. He had, I think it was even uh, Najal Stormcaller. I think it was one of the, it was one of the major rune priests in the Space Wolves chapter told him he had to go in here and he had to confront whatever it was in this dream state he was going to go into. And realizing that whatever happened in the dream was going to really affect him. Like, if right. he died in the dream, he was going to die. 
You know, this this wasn't just a dream state. This was an alternate reality almost. Mm -hmm. And I thought that this scene captured that. So when you read those kind of things later with the Space Wolves, you're going to go, oh, I remember that from Prospero Burns. I remember how important these visions and these dream states were to the Space Wolves and as part of their culture. Yep. Yeah. So So. uh, I think, let's see, at this point... um... Let's see. Taken captive, Hellwolf. Uh, yeah, you you went through that. Basically, predicts what he's seen with chaos, and he's essentially executed at that point. Yeah, yeah. There, Hellwinter's going to have nothing nothing to do with him. He's mm-hmm. gone because he's not really Hellwolf. Right. Know? Yes. So, exactly. That's the point. So we want to move into the final act of. of I think so. The titular section, the thing. I mean, the thing we've been waiting for the entire novel. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> the burning of Prospero. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Oh yes. man, I think I think if I had to give this a one word review, I would just put tease. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or I don't know, maybe f- <laughs> foreplay, forty k edition, <laughs> just so <laughs> the whole thing. <laughs> that is so true. God. Uh, so, so go ahead. So where are we? We're basically this. We're at the point now. It, it has fast forwarded. Where the space wolves have been told by the emperor, go bring Magnus to justice. Again, stressing the fact that the emperor did not tell Russ to kill him. Yes. So uh, for violating the edict of Nikea. Um, and here's where it's interesting that you. One of the things I I thought was fascinating is how Lehman Russ used Hauser as a communications conduit to Magnus. Yep. Thinking, and I thought it, it was logical. He did the right thing. He's like, how can I, what's my most reliable way to get in contact with Magnus through the, quote, war? Yep. You know, I'm going to use Hauser and say, hey, one last chance. I do not want to do this, brother. I do not want to blow up your planet. I don't want to do this. Please get back to me. Now, so I thought that was really interesting. And the other thing, though, I thought was interesting was, like, couldn't you use more reliable means? Like, could you not send like an astropathic message? Could you not send like some kind of a Vox warning? It just, I'm thinking of these other things. Like if that's really what you want to do. Yeah. I just interesting. And that's, and that's where I, I, I like the minutia of like the back and forth of, well, the people who are space wolf fans can say, we tried to call, you know, you guys, you guys put your own personal hotline inside of the fang and we used it and you didn't answer. So I don't know what to tell yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. That's, that is technically true at the same time. Exactly what you're saying of like, there are so many better ways to communicate a warning because now we've seen the thousand sun side of like, oh, they just showed up and immediately nuked no, no, the no, planet. No, no. <laughs> uh, and, and this is, yeah, exactly. This is like dialectically opposed diametrically opposed yes to that <laughs> that that russ did even though he was angry and you know he at this point we know in the story he'd been manipulated by horace you know to to kill magnus because that's what he had he he didn't do that he's still he wasn't this vicious animal that we have been told that he was right he's still intelligent he's thoughtful he does not want to destroy his brother or his brother's planet. And it's like, just come with me quietly. Let's just do this. Get yeah. it over with. And so, yeah, that didn't work out. <laughs> no, patently no. So, so as we we all know, space wolves invade the planet, decimate everything except Tiska, which is the planet, the, the capital, capital city. Yeah. Um, Hauser goes down with them. He actually kills one of the spire guard because Hauser is, you know, Superman now. Yeah, and he's been doing CrossFit on the Fang. They taught him how to use an axe <laughs> on the trip. Yeah, on the trip there. So he's fighting in a temple, and he finds himself in a room from one of his dreams, and there's a chaos entity there, looking like Horus. Yes. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
this is the guy who was standing behind me that I couldn't figure out who it was. Yeah. And it this chaos entity. Now we know it's a chaos entity. You know, that's what it is. It conf, you know confesses to him that it manipulated him. All the things he knows already. You know, it yep. manipulated him. Uh, he's he showed up. You know, Amon showing up on IKEA wasn't really Amon. Uh, the real Amon was somewhere else. It's all part of this plan that I have to turn the two legions against each other. Mm-hmm. So this this part of the story, this battle was pretty cool. So you have yeah. Fifth, who is, remember that name from one of the tribesmen that saved him, who ended up becoming a space marine, which yep. is cool, um, over the years. Then Bear, and then Hellwinter, who we know, they all arrive but the entity overpowers every one of them except for Bear with that using their names thing. Here is the name. Mm-hmm. Use the name. I know your name. Uh, but Bear, he, he didn't fall for this. But in kind of, again, a uh, kind of telling of the story before the story, his arms get set afire. And... Hauser cuts Bear's arm off to save him because this fire was going to spread. This was, yeah. it seemed to me, I don't know about you, but kind of, it was kind of like a psychic fire. You know, yeah, was, I kind of like think of like, um, if you've seen like the zine chart, like warp flame, it kind yes. of has a sticky quality to it. Yeah. <laughs> so it seemed like that. Yeah. yeah. And so he cuts off Bear's arm. And just as he does that, two dreadnoughts come in with a bunch of silent sisters. And yeah. It's like, Oh, such a great scene. Oh my gosh. And they just they just drill this thing full of holes and beat it to a pulp, basically. Uh, because there's nothing it can do against these dreadnoughts. No, 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 no. Yeah, um, and it turns out that for all you Space Wolves fans who know about the chapter, that Bear's real name is not Bear. It is Bjorn. Yes. And what is Bjorn's nickname, my friend? Bjorn the Fell Handed. Ha! Huh, there we go. All yep. right. I thought that was so awesome. That, yes. that was the story. That yeah. was so exciting. And basically it was because the um if I'm not mistaken, because the person who incepted the the Fenrisian language into Hauser didn't under he, he mispronounced Bear and Bjorn. Mm-hmm. So because he got the name wrong and the word wrong, he was never able to get power over him so a miss you know he failed his duolingo class and <laughs> got him killed he, he used the wrong true name he didn't know the exactly. true name he knew a name but it wasn't the right one and so we know the story of the ending at prospero what happened uh and then uh hauser has a final conversation with lehman Rus or lehman russ or however you want to pronounce it so uh, and they put him into stasis basically, and he goes voluntarily. Yep, because he doesn't know when or if he's going to be used again. And yeah. So I I thought it was a a kind ending on behalf of the space wolves because it's like they could have I mean they could and probably should have just killed him, but yes. <laughs> but yes. they're like, well, it's nice to have a two way radio. <laughs> yeah, and I think part of it was they. You know, from the beginning, they really invested in him. They put resources into him. The fact that they took the time to rebuild his body and do all those things. That part of it, as you said, was because they wanted to see what was going to happen. Right. They wanted to find out who the person was driving it. But I think they also had become to accept him at some level as a member of their tribe. Yeah, absolutely. I, th- I do think they hit enough notes of them trusting him like as a person. Yes. And that I liked. I mean, of course, there's always the obvious. They could just kill him at any time. I mean, anyone, oh, sure. any other character in that book could kill Hauser at any time. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, so, there, you know, there's some give and take there. But, uh, yeah, no, I thought I thought they did a good job of representing him as trusted. So that's the story. So what do you think, Dan? Uh, I don't know. There were just so many things that happened that there was no real explanation for it was it was difficult to follow the story when that kind of stuff happened 
Now, there were explanations later, but you had to wait so long to figure out what was going on. And, you know, in a good murder mystery, you don't know exactly what's happening, but at least it always moves you towards the end. I just thought a lot of the dream sequences that you've talked about and a lot of the other things in the book just didn't add to the flow of the book. It, It seemed to you're moving along, the story's going and all of a sudden, boom, you hit like a speed bump and you have to slow down. Yeah, and that just seemed to happen frequently to me in terms of listening or reading the story. Yeah, my 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 word uh, is pacing. I think yeah. it could have used there. There were some uh, examples of someone could have killed their darlings. Is a literary thing <laughs> where you you get rid of parts that you really like for the sake of the story. Some fat could have been trimmed. I think is probably a, a more American way that I would say it. <laughs> sure, um, sure. but. Yeah, I think overall, like the shift from focusing on it all being about learning the wolves and then seeing what they do to justify their actions, I, I feel like was way too sharp and and difficult as a reader for me to stick with. But I don't, I can't. I mean, but uh, that being said, I'm not a literary person. I can't recommend how to fix it. I don't know. <laughs> it just seemed I, jarring. I, you know, you're talking about one of the greatest writers in. Yeah, I don't. You know, I mean. <laughs> I'm not going to Monday night quarterback or whatever. Dan Abnett. <laughs> Dan Abnett yeah. <laughs> but again, you're, you're right about some things. I, we talked, you know, pre-show about this one scene that uh, it just, I don't know. I just thought that it, it's near the end of the book. Thank goodness. But you know, the, the space wolves come and are like about to invade the planet. And then it takes forever for them actually to invade. Yeah. Like, just pages and pages and pages of descriptions of this thing moving here and all these this details. And you're just going, please, please just get on with the story. Well, uh, yeah. And then with contrast with how the Space Wolves came onto the scene in Thousand Suns where they had oh. the drop pod that like <laughs> landed four feet from Magnus. Where you're right. like, this is yeah. what I wanted and, and expected. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So just just different, you know, different author, different Yep. method to your point of storytelling was it worthwhile i think so for me the biggest payoff was learning more about the wolves culture i agree i, I think that is the the biggest takeaway that would feed into later reading of space wolves lore and other stories and the heresy that involved the wolves yep so and even if you're just a 40k wolves fan I think you could really benefit from reading this to tie in some of the things you read about that you might not understand. Yeah. If- and, and and that being said, like, I think the stronger part of the book was the earlier one when we were getting to know the wolves, like mm-hmm. uh, just from like, you know, having an academic be dropped into that world and we have to learn with him. He can't write anything down. So all the story and the dialogue is what we have to work with. Like those are great framing devices and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Like it's a good, it's a good book for learning. It's not necessarily like, I don't think action is its strong point. Cause I think it goes oh, no. way too no. hard from scene to scene no. for those actions to have much meaning, but they, yeah. you know, we get to see the wolves in action, which I think is, is cool. So yes, absolutely. Good. Um, Any over- other final thoughts for you? Uh, not, not particularly other than I, the, I kind of got the sense towards the end of the book, you know, like in Lord of the Rings, when the end sequence happens and you're like, okay, and you go to stand up and then you realize there's like eight more endings. That movie has like 30 (laughs) endings. That's kind of how I felt towards the end of this, where it's like, um, and then Hauser awoke and it was all a dream. And then there's like a scene where that happens three times in a row where you're like, (laughs) My guy, get the hell out of bed. <laughs> we we got chaos space marines to fight. <laughs> I just had this moment right? where you're like, move the plot. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. That was it. I mean, it was. I mean, overall, I thought it was a fun story. I think the first half is much more fun, but sure. You know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, what do you want to do for for next time? I don't know. I think. You had talked a little bit about uh, maybe going through some of the chapters and talking about the legions and talking about some of their peculiarities or some of the things that tie them together. And an example I would use is I think that 
there are a lot of similarities between the White Scars and the Space Wolves. Yeah. Uh, and maybe talk about some of those things and how they how they interact with the Imperium as individual legions, something like that. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I'll tell you what. I will take the role of the, the the research lead on the Space Wolves. I know you're a White Scars guy. Oh, big time. Yeah. Let's rendezvous and we'll talk about and compare and contrast those two particular legions. Sure, we can do that. And then uh, why don't we juxtaposition to that, talk about two legions who are very much in line with the Imperium and the Imperium message. Sweet. Right. Okay, so next time we'll be covering some Loyalist. Uh, this will be the first time we move away from the, the book-style format, so that'll be good, I think. Yeah. We'll give ourselves a little break, and we'll talk about some cool stuff. So if you have questions about uh, the Loyalists in general, how they all get along, I guess is probably a, a good way to surmise that, as well as the comparing and contrasting of two particular legions, go ahead and let us know. I would love to uh, answer any questions we can look up uh, as we go, as we do research. And so, yeah. Uh, any right. other last things you want to add there, Dan? No, I think that's it. Okay. Great. If, if you want to Great hang out questions. with us, uh, you can follow Dan and his co-host Brennan with Cubic Shenanigans as they talk about all things hobby with an Age of Sigmar focus. Uh, my channel, 2 Plus Stuff, for all things lore and whatever I am obsessed with that particular week. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll catch you next time for uh, The Emperor Protects, friends. All right, take Perfect. care, everybody.